Nancy, we are ready for you. Come back and help, help us get washed. <laughs> Well, not too many empty seats, so I didn't scare too many people away. It's a whole other day's training. But I could share with you about this coming generation and what the Lord has shown me, how they're going to be used, and they better have some folks to train them and equip them, equip them for what's ahead. And we've been falling down on the church, on the job church. We've been asleep at our post, and that's why the Lord has sent me here to sound an alarm and say spiritual mums need to arise, Debras need to arise. When I first started my counseling profession, I was working as the executive director of another nonprofit Christian organization. And I remember sharing with some of my staff about some of the spiritual dynamics I was witnessing in my counseling office. Because there are things that I believe are clinical and there are things that are spiritual. And sometimes they're one and the same, oftentimes. It's just a matter of how we treat it. And I was sharing this, this uh, during a staff meeting with some women <coughs> about what I was seeing. And I had one of my staff members rebuke me. And she was a lady, oh, maybe five years younger than I am. I consider her very solid in the word, very grounded. And we'd come together. We had children the same age. She had two boys, and I had two girls. And I was there when my daughters were in high school. And I remember coming to staff meeting and saying, this is really embarrassing, but i got to tell you what. Daughter number one did. Or daughter number two did, and I need some prayer. i got to go to war for my kids. And this one woman would just, I don't have those problems with my boys. <laughs> How nice for you. I don't believe you for a minute. <laughs> or else you're very naive. Now, she just couldn't understand because if I was being the submissive stay-at-home mom I was supposed to be, I wouldn't have problems in my home. And so when I was sharing some of the things I was encountering in my counseling office, she spoke up and rebuked me and said, Nancy, you have no business being in the counseling profession. I don't. Don't you understand that you're opening the door to the demonic just by delving into that? You're going to encounter. You're putting yourself in a place where God never intended you to be. I said, well, that's interesting because he was pretty clear. I've been hearing this for five years. He's made it abundantly clear over and over that this is where he was calling me. And she said, the only thing you are supposed to be doing, Nancy, is to be a godly wife and mother and tend to your home and raise up the next generation. <clears throat> and I respected her. She was a woman of the word. She loved Jesus. She ran a tight ship at home. But I looked at her, <clears throat> and I could have said a lot of things. <laughs> but the Lord graciously restrained my tongue because he taught me a long time ago that Jesus is to be my example in dealing with everyone. And Jesus never gave his opinion on anything. Did you know that? He never gave his opinion. And there was one day I sat in a church out in the Midwest, sitting there looking at all the things that they could do to improve if somebody would just put me on a board or a committee and I could help them out with that because I was new to the area. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, Nancy, I know you have an opinion about everything, but not everybody wants to hear it. <laughs> and I thought, but Lord, I could help them. I could help them organize some things. And he said, this is my conversation, remember? I said to have these conversations. He said, I'll make a deal with you. You can give your opinion the next time somebody asks for it. I said, okay. <laughs> and guess what? <laughs> So I sat there and learned how to keep my mouth shut. And he taught me how to respond as Christ responded. And Christ always responded with one of two ways. He responded with scripture or biblical principles, told stories, or he learned how to ask thought-provoking questions. 
And so there is a real skill and an art, and it represents great spiritual maturity when you can learn to ask the right questions. You don't need to tell somebody your opinion. Just lead them to examine some things by a well-placed question. So I looked at this woman when she told me, your only role is to be in your home and be a wife and a mother. And I said to her, but what about the Deborahs and the Esters? Where are they? Doesn't God call for Deborahs and Esters anymore? And she looked at me and she said, well, maybe, but I'm not one of them. I said, I know that, but I think I am. <laughs> and so I'm sorry that you don't understand the call on my life, and you, would nev you will never have to give an account of my life before God. I'm never going to give an account for your life or your marriage. And this is the other thing scripture shows us is I'm not responsible for pointing your sin out to you. Just as with Achan's sin, God will be the one to point it out. I have no responsibility to point your sin out to you. I need to deal with my own. And then it does say in scripture, in Galatians, I believe, that those of us who are in a good place, spiritually healthy, are supposed to help others back from the brink, but be really careful because it could be us tomorrow that needs help. So when you draw someone back, a brother or sister in Christ, you do it with all meekness and humility because you don't know what mess you're going to be in tomorrow. Having said that, God is calling Deborah's. And I think there are other Deborahs in this room today. Do you guys know who Deborah was? There's a company of women that God has been strategically positioning over the past many years for the days that are coming. And for those of you who may be 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and thinking, I've just got to sit by and watch because I just don't have the energy and the strength and the endurance. As long as you're drawing breath, you have a contribution to make. There are some Grammys in this room that need a kick in the rear. Because some of you have a Deborah call on your life. And we need to be alert and at our posts and watching on behalf of our children and the generations to follow. Okay, I'm going to step on a limb here. Keep stretching with me, folks. For those of you who understand what I mean by prophetic ministry, and any time I say I've had a dream or a revelation, that's prophetic insight that the Lord's given me. I heard some time ago, years ago, <coughs> excuse me, the fact that there is a generation of gray hairs. This was a prophetic word that was given to somebody I'm in a relationship with gray hairs, and they were the older men and women who had lived through World War II. And that most of those people are in their 80s and 90s now. And they were strong prayer warriors. And they were people who stood for godly principles and biblical principles. And it's the prayers of that generation that have been holding back the tide of evil and darkness. And that when that generation dies out, the prayer wall is down. That's a warning, folks. Get on your knees and start praying. The generations depend on it. If you know the Bible, you know the end of the story. We know it's going to get darker before our Lord comes again. But in the midst of it, he's going to be there in power and might doing miraculous things. And he's going to be using a company of people who are oaks of righteousness, whose roots go down deep into the word, and they will not be moved. And they will shine out light. And the scripture says there's healing in their leaves, and the nations will run to them. You will notice that if you carry any of the anointing in the presence of the Lord, you carry his light and his love, people are drawn to you. And the more desperate it gets, the darker the days become, the more people are going to be coming. It gets to the point where I've shared, I've had somebody grab me on the post office steps sobbing. Just somebody I knew from somewhere and just saying, I can't take it anymore. I've got all these medical issues. Going to Walmart, somebody, can you pray for me? 
right now, right here. Have you got a minute? Can we go get a cup of coffee? Can we go to lunch? And you're going to find that there's a pulling if you haven't already felt it. And if you aren't feeding yourself spiritually, you're not going to have anything to give. And as I'm talking to you, none of this is in my notes. So I'm going to share with you another little uh, prophetic revelation the Lord gave me one day. And it was about the wise and the foolish virgins. <coughs> the story in scripture. And basically, the nutshell here is don't be a stupid virgin. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in the story, there are five wise virgins, virgins and five foolish virgins. And they've all got these lamps with oil in them. And what does oil represent in the Holy Spirit? Or in, in the Bible, there's your clue. It represents the Holy Spirit. And they're waiting for the bridegroom to come. Because they're going to get married. But while they're waiting, it's getting dark all around them. And they've got their lamps. And the wise virgins are being attentive to pay attention to the oil in their lamp. But the foolish virgins aren't paying attention. They're not alert. They're not watchful. And it's gotten much darker. And guess what? The bridegroom, Jesus, comes when it's the darkest. And so the wise virgins take their lamps because they're carrying the light. And they're finding their way to the bridegroom. And the foolish virgins do what? Do you remember what they do? Can I have some of yours? Can I have some of your oil? And this is what the Lord spoke to me. It's in the next phrase. What do the wise virgins say to the foolish virgin? No. Nope. I just got enough for me. Go get your own. And what the Lord showed me was there's coming a day, not very far down the road, where it's going to be so dark that you're going to have all you can do to keep your own oil filled. And so all those people that have been sucking the life out of you and drawing from you emotionally and spiritually, they're going to have to find their own oil. And there will come a day when you're going to be able to look, need to look at somebody and say, I'm sorry, I have nothing for you. And you don't need to feel guilty about that. We aren't going to have a bunch of codependents in heaven. You can't, I know the Lord said that to me years ago. He says, Nancy, I know you want everyone to come with you on this journey, but not everybody's coming. And I've watched people drop out along the way. It's just too hard. The price is too high to walk with Jesus. But guess what? The price is high if you don't. So pay attention to your oil. So I said to somebody, check your dipstick once in a while. <laughs> you might be surprised how low the oil is. And don't feel guilty when somebody's asking something of you that you can't give. Okay, somewhere in here, we'll get back to Esther and Deborah. We have a nation in need of some spiritual mothering and some spiritual defense. I've learned, I don't know what it is about me, but wherever I go, no matter what setting I'm in, people think I work there. <laughs> if I'm in Walmart or a restaurant, and on my way to the hotel this morning, I just went to get a cup of cocoa. And some young man comes up to me and says, uh, ma'am, somebody put this half-filled carton of milk back in the refrigerator. Would you like me to throw it out? I don't care what you do. <laughs> I'll just play along. Why, yes, I think that would be best. <laughs> okay, thank you. And he went off and he came back with two little cartons of milk, one skim and one 2%. Ma'am, which one of these milks is the closest to whole milk? <laughs> okay. And he was picking up around there and asking me questions and wanting to know if it was okay. I didn't bother to tell him the difference. And I was pondering this in light of that. And the fact of the matter is, he wanted some direction. And he went to somebody he thought could give him some direction. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to be able to help people find their way by asking the right questions, by sharing your testimony. 
I don't know what God wants you to do, but here, let me share a similar situation I lived through and how God ministered in the midst of it. Always remember that when you share your testimony, the purpose is to, to point people to Jesus, not to tell them what a saint you are. We're talking today about dealing with dirty, stinking things and sneaky people who don't want to get clean. I'm not here to talk to you about the virtues of being a good wife, a mother, or a homemaker. Those things are vitally important. But we're here, again, talking about warfare. I'm here to rally the troops. I'm here to sound an alarm. And I'm here to say that your father has need of you and the hour is late. In Romans 13, 11 to 14, we read a very dire warning. It is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is nearly over and the daylight is near. So discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk with decency as in the daylight, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and promiscuity, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no plans to satisfy the flesh. That speaks completely to all those open doors we just looked at in the assessments. Let's get rid of that stuff. Walk in the open, walk in the light. Going back to Deborah. Who was she? I heard some of you say it. She was a judge over who? Israel. Over God's people, the nation of Israel. She was the only woman judge that God set over this nation. You know she had her own, history tells us she had her own business. She's a businesswoman. She made candles. And history and the scriptures tell us that she used to sit under her palm tree minding her business, making her candles, and the men of Israel, the leaders, the warriors, the heads of state, would come to her to inquire what the Lord was saying. They would not go into battle without speaking to her first. And sometimes they required her to accompany them into battle. In Judges 5, we read these words, and this is a call to you today. Awake, Deborah, awake. Sing a song. And in the same chapter, just out a few verses in Judges 5, we read that the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Do you know who the sons of Issachar were? Do you know the si significance of the sons of Issachar? I think they're found in 2 Chronicles, somewhere in Chronicles. Those were men that knew the times and the seasons and knew what to do about them. They were watchmen and they were with Deborah. They advised leaders and heads of states and warriors because they were spiritually alert and watchful. When God speaks to his people, he uses words and symbols that have meaning to them. Ezekiel was a scholar and an intellectual. See, his visions from God were complex and difficult to understand. If you've ever tried to read Ezekiel, all those uh, chariots and wheels and animals. Hosea was a laborer, and God spoke to him by using a plumb line. It was a simple tool used by laborers, but it contained a profound message. Likewise, this vision contains a washing machine and dirty sneakers, something every woman in this room can relate to. Meaningless to people of the Bible, but for a 21st century Christian, symbols which are re easily recognized and understood, but containing a very profound message. Whatever God method God chooses to deliver his messages to us, they're all meant to prepare us for the days ahead. He's trying to teach us how to give a strategy and how to defeat the enemy and take that ground. And above all, to not just take that ground, this was stolen from our families, but to advance God's kingdom. Why did we do these assessments today? Some of you might be sitting here feeling rather discouraged and defeated by what you've written on your papers. Don't give in to the discouragement because you haven't heard the end of the story yet. 
There was one particular time that God convicted me of a sin issue in my life. Well, really more than one, but I'm going to tell you about one. <laughs> and like many people, I've been married 31 years. And some of those 31 years were fun and some weren't. And there was a time when I just lost myself in romance novels. Because I could just kind of escape there. Now, you might escape into exercise, or food, or farmland, or Pinterest. I don't know what you escape into. But we all have that place to go when life just gets a little overwhelming. And when God showed that to me, it didn't feel good. When he showed me, I had a little stronghold. Well, what do you mean, God? I'm just reading this book. I'm not bothering anybody. But what I found was, as I read these romance novels, they tended, over the years, to get more and more graphic. It's never a good feeling to see things in your life the way God sees it, and to acknowledge the ways that we've messed up. Because as I'm sitting there trying to say, well, Lord, you know, and he said, you have a lust issue, and I consider it adultery. Because when you go to bed and you try to be with your husband, those characters are still in your head. I'm here to tell you, I'm not the only woman like that. And there's like, ooh, Lord, that's kind of harsh. Adultery? Lust? Things are pretty simple with God. Black and white. We like to minimize, rationalize, defend, explain. We have good reasons for all the things we do. But you know, he didn't show me that to beat me up. He didn't tell me I was a failure, because that's not the way my God works. Remember in Romans 8.1, it says that if we belong to Jesus, we're not condemned. God doesn't give up on us just because we make mistakes. He says, you see this little problem here, Nancy? What are we going to do about that? I want you to stop that, because it really disappoints me. And it's really not becoming. And you can't go where I want to take you with this in the way. And so for a few minutes, it's humiliating and embarrassing. And when God shows it to you, you'll feel about this big. And that's when you get on your face and you cry out. You say, I'm really, really sorry. You feel really stupid. And then he looks at me and says to me, what he said to Joshua, get up. <laughs> get up off your face. You're sorry, I forgave you, it's done. And in that moment, it was gone. Now when I walk by Walmart or certain bookstores and I can recognize those authors, and I know that if I picked one of those up, I would enjoy that. And it would be easy to open that door again. But the Lord set me free from that. And so I stay on guard and alert and watchful. Because I know the enemy wants me destroyed. And he's not having me. And I just say to him, yeah, I see you there. Get out of my way. I'm coming through. I see it. Learn his strategies. Learn how to watch for him. Not to focus on him, but just so you'll stay safe and you won't get tripped up. The Lord doesn't condemn us because we fall down a few times. Or because we trip. He's a trip up while trying to figure things out. What he does is he comes along and graciously picks us up and he whispers encouraging words in our ears. We should not and cannot condemn ourselves for not being perfect. If you will not let go of the past, that is an insult to the cross of Christ. You are insulting the blood of Jesus because you're saying, well, his, his blood's good enough for everybody else's sin, but it's not good enough for mine. So I'm going to have to hang on to this. I have to pay my penance. I have to punish myself. Oh, get over yourself, would you? That's a lot of self-focus. It's whining. Repent. Receive your forgiveness. Get up off your face and let's go. And we need to start measuring ourselves against somebody else's spiritual walk. If you just keep focusing on growing closer to Jesus and don't give up, you're going to be fine. James 3, 2 says that we all stumble in many ways. Those little things on your piece of paper, those are just some rocks you tripped over on the way. 
The only problem comes when you don't want to deal with them. You know, if we had to wait until we were perfect before we could minister, nobody would ever qualify for ministry. I mentioned to you before the story of Peter in Matthew 16, and Jesus blessed Peter that day, and he gave him the keys to the kingdom just before he had to turn around and rebuke him and call him Satan. Right after this great blessing, when Jesus says, hey, Peter, you got it. You've had a revelation from the Father. You couldn't have known this about me without a revelation. You're really on the ball, Pete. He's feeling pretty good. Here's the keys to the kingdom. And then in a few hours, when Jesus is saying, I'm going to be crucified, Peter's going, oh, no. No, that's not going to happen. <coughs> and Jesus turned around and said, get behind me, Satan. Pete tripped over a rock. He fell down. But you know what? The Lord didn't take the keys to the kingdom away from Peter. In fact, Jesus already knew when he gave Peter the keys to the kingdom that he was going to trip up. The Lord has proven over and over again that he will use men and women long before the rest of us would. And even before he asks us to do something, he already knows the mistakes we're going to make. Many of you, he's implanted a little vision and a passion in. He knows you're going to make some mistakes along the way. Don't wait till you have all the details worked out and ensure that it's going to per be perfect. Just start moving. Keep your eyes on Christ. And don't beat yourself up when you fall down. It appears that the Lord wants all of us to have a safe place with safe people where we can make mistakes while we're trying to learn and grow. We don't expect our children to be mature and responsible when they're little children. The same is true in the church. We have to learn how to correct mistakes. I find that in the churches, we tend to lean either way to one side or the other on the pendulum. We're all about grace and love and forgiveness, and we never confront anything because we're just going to extend the love of Christ. Or we're way over here on the truth side, and it's all about condemnation and repentance and sin where there's this place in the middle where the pendulum swings that says, you will always extend grace and mercy. But there comes a point when we expect an accountability between brothers and sisters. And there are times that I need to confront brothers and sisters. As a ministry, we use Matthew 18 as, as our uh, model for dealing with confrontation. We have a problem, one-on-one -on -one we're going to go, that doesn't solve it, we're going to take a witness and go, and if that doesn't solve it, it's coming before the group. And if somebody chooses to create a scene in the midst of the assembly, that's where it's going to get dealt with. And what that does is it, it demonstrates and it models true Christ-like love, which is I care enough about you and I need to make this a safe place for the others to let you know this is not okay, this is not appropriate. We have to get to the place where there's a safe place to learn, but where our mistakes are corrected, because that's how we learn. If nobody corrects us, how are we going to learn anything? But that correction must encourage and free us. It shouldn't be a correction that condemns and crushes. In Zechariah 3, 1 through 7, there's an account of Joshua standing before the Lord. And he's in filthy garments. Now remember we started out with the scripture of Joshua. He'd been successful and victorious in battle and had honor before God. Well now over in Zechariah, Joshua is standing before the Lord in filthy garments and Satan standing right beside him to accuse him and oppose him. And Satan's looking at the Lord saying, look how filthy this guy is. Look at his clothes. Do you know what the Lord does and what he says? He just, he just looks at an angel and says, take his filthy clothes off him. Give him some new clothes. <coughs> Put a clean turban on his head. Some bright new clothes. So the angel took away the dirty clothes, placed a clean turban on his head. And the Lord promised, after Joshua changed his clothes, the Lord looked at him and said, I'm going to use you mightily. 
The only thing you have to do, Joshua, is obey my commands and uphold biblical precepts. I'll give you some clean clothes. Don't worry about that. When you get dirty, just come stand before me and tell me you need a change of clothes. We'll take care of that. That's easy. And then I'm going to use you mightily. Just remember who's calling the shots. So some of you might be asking, why do I need to get clean? Hopefully I've explained that. Um, we've had to assess the areas of our life where we're living like Achan, living in denial with hidden sin and placing ourselves and maybe some others in danger. You know, probably most women could tell you if they've been married any amount of time or whether you haven't been married. It would be very easy to have unholy relationships, affairs, <coughs> sexual relationships. And anytime those opportunities present themselves, there's a question that would, I, I would encourage you to ponder. What is the price, not only to me, but to anyone else, if I engage in this thing that I want to do right now? Let's take it outside the realm of relationships. In whatever, maybe you're spending money you shouldn't be spending. Maybe you have a problem with gambling. I don't know what the secret sin is, but if you stop and assess what is the price, not only to me, but to people I love. That's often the motivation, um, what will restrain you from following through. Once we've determined the areas where we need help, and you've all got some things on your papers, well, I probably should give a prize. Is there somebody here who doesn't have anything on any other papers? <laughs> okay. No prizes. <laughs> Once we've determined the areas where we need some healing and help, now what? Well, you have one last hand up. And it's called, it's got my pretty little stick man on there. And it's called Healthy Accountability. And I don't necessarily like to use that word, I think it's overused, but it is what it is. And I don't have a good substitute for it. And as we say, you won't find the word accountability in scripture anywhere, but the concept is there from Genesis to Revelation. Just like you won't find the word Trinity in the Bible. You won't find the word rapture in the Bible, but the concept is there. It's important that we all have accountability in our lives because God made us for community. We need other people. And here, if we talk about the pendulum swing, there's this place where people go that's independence, that says, I really don't need anybody. And I don't commit to anybody, and I never really settle anywhere, and I don't develop relationships. Um, you'll know as much about me as I want you to know. And I, you know what it's like to be in the middle of a crowd and still be alone. Be in the middle of a crowd and nobody really knows you. That's why we're here on this independent side. It's a very lonely place. But it's easier to be alone than to let people really see who we are sometimes. Way on the other side of the pendulum is codependency. What that means is we're all so meshed in each other's lives. And we've got too much to say about everybody else and we worry too much about everybody else so we don't even know who we are and we can't take a stand for anything because everything we do is determined by other people. Neither one of those extremes is what God wants. He wants us in this middle spot which is called interdependence. Not independence, not codependence, interdependence. And that means I need you and you need me. You will never dictate who I am. My identity is not drawn from you. But I can't get through life on my own. And I need brothers and sisters. I need the body to help me stay strong, to pick me up when I fall. In Ecclesiastes, it says, if one goes out by himself into battle, when he falls down, there's not going to be anybody to pick him up. But if two or three go out, they'll have somebody with them. And it's very specific. It's, it says if one goes out, when he falls. 
When one goes and you're all by yourself, you will fall. And who's going to be there to pick you up and dust you off and say, come on, I believe in you, I love you, we can do this. And if two or three go, it says, if they fall. Because we're less likely to fall if we're walking with others. So when I talk about accountability, I tell folks in our ministry, you can stay pretty safe if you have accountability in three levels. Those are those three little lines by our stick man. And on the top line, everybody needs to have a spiritual elder. Now, that is a spiritual mom, a spiritual dad, a spiritual elder. It may be a pastor, a shepherd. But I have a lot of people who can tell me who their pastor's name is, but their pastor doesn't know them from a hole in the ground. And the pastor doesn't have a clue what's going on in their life. That is not accountability, to be able to tell me who your covering is. And is it really covering if they don't know you? I'm all about asking questions that kind of challenge the way we've been doing church. I believe in the church. But we really need to examine what we do and why we do it. Don't hide under a pseudo relationship with the head of some ministry. I've had people come up to me and say, Nancy, you're my spiritual elder. Really? I didn't know that. I don't know you. You've been in some meetings, but I don't know what's going on in your life. Because there's a responsibility there if you're someone's spiritual elder. These are people who are healthy emotionally, relationally, spiritually. They have a little more wisdom and insight. They're down the road a little further in their spiritual walk. And when you fall down or you're confused, you can go to them and say, I'm not really sure what's happening here, or could you help me? This is embarrassing. And it doesn't matter what you tell them, they're okay. And they say, okay, listen, this is what I would advise. This is what scripture says. They're people that know the word. They live the word. They're not just spewing scripture at you. They've lived it. Secondly, we all need peer accountability. These are men or women that are basically where we're at in our spiritual walk. And we've given them permission to speak into our lives and say, hey, if you feel anything funky coming off me, if you think I'm jealous or bitter, you know, call me on that, let me know. And you know they'll do it, but you, they do it because they love you. And you're trying to figure out life together. And the third level of accountability is a mentoring relationship where you're pouring into someone who's younger than you in the faith. You're actively discipling or mentoring. Now I'm not talking about holding a class. I'm talking about the fact that there's a younger person than you in their faith that you're having coffee with intentionally once a week or sharing a meal with or sitting in a Bible study with and saying, listen, how are things going? How's that problem at the job? How are you doing with Johnny's second grade teacher? How can I encourage you? How can I pray for you? Because all of a sudden when you start mentoring people and you realize somebody else's eyes are on you, you're not quite as quick to dive into those little things the flesh might want to do because you're aware that you are modeling and demonstrating Christ-like behavior for others. If you have accountability at those three levels, that's good protection against any strategies that the enemy might throw at you. So, how many of you have a spiritual elder that speaks into your life, you've given permission to, raise your hand up high, that really knows you? Okay, maybe half of you. How many of you have peer accountability? I'm talking about honest, genuine relationship. A little more. How many of you are actively mentoring or discipling other people? Okay, that's the lowest. This is one, another part of your homework. Get these things in place. You're going to need it in the days ahead. You're not going to be able to do this alone.
there was, the Lord speaks to me about through everything that happens in the news. I want to say it was two years ago. The Christmas tree fell on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Does anybody remember that story? There was a Christmas tree that had been there, and it, I think it was planted after, in the 1940s. Been there a long time. And some winds came through and broke the tree. And when they talked about why it was broken, it's surrounded by a whole ring of other Christmas trees. I think one from every state. I'm trying to remember how this went. But the thing I remember, the premise, was what the Lord showed me when I read the news article was, said this tree was more vulnerable because it stood alone and it was apart from all the other trees. God's raising up trees right now. They're oaks of righteousness. But if you are not in a community of other trees, you're much more susceptible to go down when the winds come up. <coughs> Ladies, why do you suppose it's important that we clean our clothes? More than just forgiveness and repentance, there's a bigger picture. I'm all about looking at things from a kingdom view. Why do you think it's important we do this? Any clues? Any guesses? Because I think that you need to know who you are in Christ and what your purpose is. Yes. You want to fulfill that line. We do. And that's individually. But there's a broader purpose. That's not a wrong answer. That's just part of the answer. It's the fact that Christ is coming for a bride. He's coming for those virgins. And in Ephesians 5, we read that Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. There's that clean word again. Washed by the cleansing of God's word. Clean, washed, cleansed. And he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or a wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. As I get ready to close here, I realize that there might be folks here who don't even understand who Jesus is or how much he loves you or what he did for you. And I also realize there are others who may have been playing church for some time. Maybe you've been that pair of sneakers. Maybe you've been holding on to some soul secrets and thought nobody was ever going to ask you about them. But God sent you here today, and he sent me here today, so that we could have this very important conversation. I was ministering to some pastors and their wives several years ago. And when I, it was separate. I ministered to the men for a few months and then with the women. And in the midst of it, the women really didn't like me very much. <laughs> and they come in and we'd have these really intense conversations, kind of like this, but in a smaller group so you couldn't escape. <laughs> and, and I'd kind of look at them by name and call them out. And one woman went home very frustrated. And her husband, who was a pastor, called me the next day and he said, I have just seen the most powerful encounter with God that I've ever seen in all my years of ministry. He said, my wife came home from that class you had. And I asked many of these same questions. And he said, she walked in the house muttering with her hands on her head. And he said, she went right by me. She said, I don't get this. I don't understand. Why, why, why? He said, and she just paced in the living room and all of a sudden fell on her knees and started sobbing. And he said, I just went over and held her. And he said, Nancy, I'm here to tell you my wife accepted Jesus last night. She's been in ministry with me for 12 years. She called me later and said, i had been hanging on my husband's coattails. Nobody knew. I didn't even know. I'd been playing the part so long that I didn't know I was faking. I didn't know I really wasn't being cleaned up. She says, but I want to tell you, God met me last night. Maybe you don't know that you've been playing or faking. If you'd like to pray with someone before you leave, please grab me. I've got a couple of board members here, or Kay. I'm sure she'd 
have some folks. Don't leave here without praying with someone if you need to. I'm going to pray for all of us before we go. Um, maybe you need to find some accountability partners. Maybe you don't even know where to start. If you don't have a church, you don't have a place of community. I don't care where people worship. I'm involved with folks in home church networks, alternative ministries where churches or meetings are being held in coffee shops and restaurants and schools and offices, the organized church. I don't care where you go. Just get involved in the body somewhere. Be in fellowship on a regular basis and take the risk to let someone know you. And take the risk to get to know other people. Because you, Deborahs, have a responsibility to guard the flock. I'd like to close with a poem before I pray that the Lord gave me several years ago. And he just he brought this to my mind last night. And I think this sums up the reason why it's so important that we take a few minutes to clean up our act here. A few days or weeks, however long it takes. Because the days ahead are going to be challenging and God is looking for some spiritual mums who aren't afraid to deal with dirty, smelly people and situations. He gave me this poem, and I'm not a poet, by the way, folks, but he has given me some very powerful poems over the years. This one came in September of 2008, and it's called The Wedding. The wedding's getting closer. Christ is coming for his bride. He's calling forth his people, and there's no safe place to hide. You can sense the wedding jitters and the people far and wide, for the wedding's getting closer, and there's no safe place to hide. The wedding's getting closer, and there is no sense of ease. There is much to yet accomplish, so we'd best be on our knees. We are past the point of planning. Many lamps have grown quite dim. The groom is coming closer. Are you ready to meet him? The wedding's getting closer. You can feel it in the air. Major change now overtakes us. Those unprepared are running scared. But the righteous remnant watches for her coming Lord and King. As the wedding grows much closer, can you hear them as they sing? Oh, the wedding is upon us. The day is now at hand. Come awaken with your spirit those who sleep throughout this land. We have hungered and we've waited. It's almost too much to bear. But the wedding is upon us and the bride must now prepare. I speak especially to the elder ladies here. You have watched and waited and hungered. Or maybe you spent the first 70 years living for the world and just came to know Jesus in your 80s. God's never wastes a moment. And you are positioned for some exciting days. Why don't you stand with me and we'll pray right now. And I just hold your papers in your hand with all those little things you wrote. You get some homework, ladies. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come and minister to your Deborahs, to this company of warriors, women who don't even know that that's what you've called them to. But as I speak it, Lord, you're depositing that in them and it's igniting a little flame and they're feeling it and they're saying, what is it, Lord, that you're calling me to? Lord, I pray that as they look at these papers, you would put them with someone, you would bring accountable uh, women of God to come alongside them. You would give them wisdom to know how to work through all of those issues. And you're a very simple God, but a powerful God. You say, it's not really tricky, folks. Confess it. Repent. And ask me to forgive you. And we're good to go. Let me clean you up. I got some clean clothes here. And Lord, for all those places where the enemy would come and cause torment and confusion in their mind to accuse the brethren to torment and to deceive. Lord, we declare him powerless in this company. Lord, I pray that you would let shame drop off, guilt, false guilt, that the works of the enemy would be destroyed by the power of your Holy Spirit in the midst of this group. Lord, I pray for complete healing, deliverance, and peace where it's needed in this room. 
Lord, for every need, marriages, finances, careers, medical issues, wherever the enemy would bring fear and tell you it's, gonna, it's bad, oh, it's so bad. Lord, I pray that you would bring fresh vision, hope, a new awareness, clarity in their mind, sharp vision. Lord, let them see things through your eyes, hear things with your ears. They need never be discouraged with the name of Jesus on their lips and the Holy Spirit living in them. Lord, set them loose in power and authority as they're obedient to draw close to you and they come with their accursed things and lay them down and say, here they are. Take them, Lord, and prepare me for what's next. Lord, I look forward to powerful testimonies and accounts of healing. I pray for great hunger to be ignited and a thirst for righteousness, a desire to see more of the kingdom. And Lord, help us to claim our regions, our homes, our communities for the kingdom. We come against and stand against all the works of darkness in this place and say, your time is done. Not another inch forward. You're not having any more ground. And we will stand united with our arms linked as a company of Deborahs. And Lord, continue to awaken us in the days ahead. Make us sharp and alert. Let it be for your glory. We thank you for your faithfulness. We praise you and ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks. <laughs>